This video is about a lap of Cyprus using a 4x4. We will tackle difficult roads and visit some wonderful locations. However, before we get started, some historical information is needed. Cyprus is mainly occupied by Greek Cypriots. However, due to various arguments, it was invaded by the Turkish in 1974 and now they occupied the northern part of the island. During this trip, we will travel through ghost towns and natural treasures located in the northern side of Cyprus. The ghost towns are mainly the result of the war. As we drive through them, I will provide all the necessary information. The trip begins tomorrow. For this lap of the island, we begin at the capital city of Nicosia and then move towards the abandoned city of Famagusta. From there on, we take the battered and rough roads towards the easternmost point of Cyprus and drive roughly 300 kilometers across the top and towards the westernmost point in Akamas National Park. Finally, we drive the lower part of the island towards the southernmost point at Akrodiri Bay. The whole trip should be about 700 kilometers and will be done in two days. We are nearly at the border that separates the south of Cyprus with the occupied side of Cyprus. It's usually a simple process to pass through. We'll probably have to make a short insurance policy for the car, but other than that, we should be through in a few minutes. And as soon as we go through Famagusta, which is the abandoned city, is going to be on our right side. have a defender in front of us and a defender behind us so three Land Rovers at the same time the border is probably going to break down for various reasons the city of Famagusta was captured and fenced preventing anyone but the army from entering the houses you see on our left and right are not even a kilometer away from the unoccupied side of Cyprus. If they were built a bit further down the road, the owners would have still been able to live in them. For now, they sit abandoned for 48 years. So this house right here uh, belongs to my grandparents. Obviously, we're not allowed to <laughs> get in it anymore. Uh, but I have a photo of my mom and my uncle in this Mercedes, which uh, we still own. Actually, the first videos on the channel were uh, taking this Mercedes out of a garage in which it was sitting for 10 years. Uh, so yeah, this photo was probably taken right next to the house on the right side when my mom used to be a kid and now uh, I am 20 years old or 24 the house is abandoned but the car is still going so these right here are the outskirts of the city we are slowly making our way towards the center and the, the center is full of tall buildings hotels and everything is abandoned So actually on this side no one is allowed to enter and over at this side so just across the road people are, li are living so it is definitely a weird place to live about one and a half years ago they opened up the main road of Famagusta so you can walk through the city and see all the 
abandoned buildings. It's pretty much a time machine back to 1974, if you imagine everything as it used to be. But now most buildings are full of bullet holes and some of them are uh, completely collapsed uh, due, to the, due to the bombing. But today we are not going to get into that road because you, you are not allowed to film in there. But I have been inside and it is uh, definitely an experience. Right here is the start of the main road and all of these buildings are the abandoned buildings of the center of the city of Famagusta. So you can cross inside from there and walk through the old city. Since this isn't the happiest place on earth and we are not really allowed to film much over here, I think it is time to move on towards the Golden Beach, which is one of the most beautiful beaches in Cyprus. It is uh, located at an untouched area of the island. There is just donkeys and wild foxes there. The roads are completely destroyed, so it is going to take about two hours to get there. But I think we have the correct vehicle for the task, so let's get started. The Golden Beach is located right next to the easternmost point of Cyprus. It gets its name from the Golden Sand. As this area is completely untouched, the water is crystal clear. At this point, we are just 80 miles away from Syria. This is the easternmost point of Cyprus, so the tip up top. On the other side, we have Turkey, Syria, and Lebanon. There are two huge Turkish flags standing right here, which mark what happened back in uh, 1974. It is a very beautiful place. It is very remote and very, very hot. This is about everything for the first day, I think. We will be making our way towards Paphos, so we are going to cover the whole top of Cyprus in one afternoon basically. We are going to cross the border back to the unoccupied side and stay the night in uh, Paphos. Tomorrow we are going to make our way into Agamas National Park towards the westernmost point of Cyprus. So we have the two ends in just 24 hours pretty much. 
so stay tuned. As the roads on the top part of Cyprus have slow speed limits, the journey from the easternmost point to the district of Paphos took about five hours. The Discovery handled the day fine and is ready for tomorrow, which is the longest part of off-road driving in the trip. slowly making our way towards the Akamas National Park. However, we have a slight issue with the car. The oil was low this morning, which is weird because um, this car didn't use to burn oil in the past. So I'm not sure where the oil has gone. It's not leaking, it's not smoking. So that's weird. Uh, I am going to check the oil in a bit again, just to make sure. And if it's still low, I'm probably gonna get some oil from the gas station and continue the journey. It appears to be full now. I really have no idea what happened. In the morning, it was right here. So, I don't know why it was like this in the morning, but it seems to be fine now. I did find it weird because this car, as I said before, never used oil before. So yeah, I think it's fine. What lies ahead are three hours of driving on rough dirt roads. To make the journey more comfortable, I am airing down my tires. This helps absorb the bumps while also increasing the tire's footprint, which in turn gives more grip. Akamas National Park covers 230 square kilometers containing valleys, gorges and sandy beaches. It is home to 168 variants of birds and the European Council has included it in its protection program. It may be one of the last truly untouched areas left in Europe. Its beauty and fun off-road trails mean that this is a place I often like to visit.
We have made it to the westernmost point of Cyprus. We are sitting in the car because it is very windy outside and you would not be able to hear what we are saying. But the terrain is similar to the easternmost point. It is full of rocks, but we do have some more mountains over here. It is a remote place. You need to drive about one hour over uh, that way to get back to the nearest village and one hour and a half towards that way which is also full of dirt. It is about midday, so I think we are going to get out of here and start making our way towards the southernmost point of Cyprus, which is the Salt Lake of Limassol. On our way towards the southernmost point of Cyprus, we will pick up Ioannis. Ioannis has studied the subject of politics in the Netherlands and has completed a project focusing on the issue of Cyprus. Because of that, we will be having a short chat at our final destination. So we are at the last destination of our trip, which is pretty much the southernmost point of Cyprus. And I'm here with Ioannis for a short interview. Since Ioannis has dove deep into the issue of Cyprus, I think it is fitting to begin with the question of why do you think this argument has been going on for so long? It is my opinion that the reason why the Cyprus issue as it is called has continued to persist since 1974 why we as a, a people and as a people I mean Greek Cypriots and Turkish Cypriots on either side of the divide why we haven't been able to reach a decision is because of many reasons one of them being that our politicians don't want the responsibility of solving the issue the responsibility meaning that there is a and this place to another reason why we still haven't solved the issue there are a lot of people in Cyprus on both sides who don't want the Cyprus issue to be solved um, because they have interests in that they after the uh, for example the Turkish Cypriots left from this the southern side of Cyprus to go to the north their properties were taken over by Greek Cypriots uh, who since then have made a, a business a flourishing business they've made apartments and houses and, um, and mansions etc so it wouldn't suit them so yeah in very simplistically uh, put this is why I believe the Cyprus issue has not yet been solved. Simply uh, uh, call it a lack of agency, call it a lack of, maybe a lack of willingness as well by a lot of people to, to solve the Cyprus issue. Um, yeah. So this is obviously a complicated subject and would you say that it is something that we may resolve in the near future or is it something that will last for many years to come? There's a saying in Greece and Cyprus that hope always dies last. So. I, I still hope that we will solve the issue and we will solve it soon before it becomes, uh, yeah, well, they call it the status quo, but before it becomes further than the status quo, it just becomes the reality of the situation. If we reach 100 years since the invasion, so that would be 2074, many people will say, well, what's the point of solving it now? It's been 100 years. You might as well leave it like that, which we don't want. Realistically speaking, uh, I don't think we're close to solving the issue. And I don't think we're close to solving the issue because we have the same 
problem that we refuse to fix in Cyprus. And it, it comes down to the fact that in Cyprus, for example, we don't vote for the best politician. We vote, we vote for the lesser uh, evil, meaning that they're all terrible, <laughs> to, to put it plainly. Uh, and in political terms, in the, in the most diplomatic way I can find. Um, they all come, they always make the same promises. Yes, I want to solve the Cyprus issue. Uh, it's about time we solved it. It's too. It's gone on for too long. And the moment they sit in that chair, the moment they win the election, they forget all about it. It all. It's always the same story. And of course, in social sciences, you never make generic uh, claims like this. You never say, oh, it's always like this because you can't. Social science is constantly changing. But this is how it always is in Cyprus. It always comes back to this. It always happens the same. And for me, one of this is one of the things that we could do to change this, but we don't do in Cyprus, one of the things, is that we don't hold not only our politicians accountable, but our journalists. In Cyprus, you might have maybe six news channels, each of them, of course, with a political affiliation, in that they support one party or the other, they support another politician, etc. And in interviews, in political debates, etc., they don't push and what I mean by they don't push. In other countries, in real democracies, France, the UK, the US, in serious places, journalists understand that their duty is not to simply ask a list of questions that have already been shared with, the, uh, with a politician. They understand that their duty is ask the question, but it, you have to have done already your research and say, for example, you say you support the Cyprus issue, yet you voted no to the uh, an unplanned. Why? You have to put them, they understand that their job is to put the politician in a quarter, in a corner, to hold them accountable to their words. In essence, their job is to make sure that what the politician is saying on live TV is what he's doing in real life, he or she. And we don't do that in Cyprus, because in Cyprus, a lot of the time, what we say is andropi, which means, no, this is, um, uh, this is embarrassing, this is wrong, this is rude. Why is it rude? You are a politician. You have a responsibility to the people. And as a journalist, it is their responsibility to put this politician accountable to the citizens. And they don't do that. And it is why a lot of the times politicians will go out, they'll make their nice speeches, they'll say their nice words, they'll again and again fool the people because journalists are not doing their jobs. And I think in the entirety of Cyprus, only one, there's only one true journalist, one that I uh, respect a lot. I've never met her, but if I do, I will consider myself blessed. Eleni Vredu. And she's the only one. She's on. She, they put her on the morning uh, in the on the radio. They don't even put her on TV, and they don't put her because she's the one that every politician fears to talk to, because she doesn't let them go. She pushes until they answer her questions, and until the story is straight. That's how it should be, but we don't do that. I think you have put that very correctly. I have never thought about the journalism issue, to be honest, because the only journalism I pay attention to is automotive journalism. But on that note, how did you find the drive in here and how did you find the fact that a car like this can bring us to a place that no one else can actually come to? Yeah, it was a good thing you had toilet paper because I fucking shit my pants. <laughs> And on that glorious note, I think it is time to end the interview. Along with the interview, our drive around the island has also come to an end. Cyprus, like any place, has its issues. However, no matter where I happen to be, there's always something bringing me back. It may be the freedom or calmness, I am not sure. In any case, thank you for watching and I will see you on the next one.